Hello, and welcome to Armory Live, and thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce our next Armory Live panel, Investing in 20th Century Creative Entrepreneurship. Today, we welcome Arts Fund Funders Forum, AFF, Director Melissa cowley Wolf as our moderator for a discussion with three visionaries at the forefront of the creative economy. Whitney Hardy, Executive Director and Founder of Third Space in Memphis, Jonathan T.D. Neal, Director of the Center for Business and Management of the Arts at Claremont Graduate University and Provost, um, and Jeremiah Olainka Ojo, Founder and Director of Ilikanwa. New for this year, our Army Live program is streaming live, so I'd also like to welcome our online viewers. We will have a brief question and answer at the end of the hour in which we'll field questions from the room and from the web, so please feel free to send your questions throughout the discussion. Without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Melissa, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Eliza, and I want to thank uh, the team here at the Armory, Nicole Berry, Aisha, and Eliza for having us today. Pulling one of these things off during this time is never easy, and I think you've done an absolutely phenomenal job, so welcome back. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's give them a little... This is the uh, first time I've spoken live in front of an audience in a year and a half, so bear with me. Everything's been on Zoom, and it's truly wonderful to be with these three individuals and with you here today. Um, as Eliza mentioned, I am the founder of an advisory firm that's focused on expanding the next generation of cultural philanthropists, advocates, and audiences. I work with cultural organizations on that and also directly with family offices, collectors, and philanthropists. And then I am the director of the Arts Funders Forum, which is a media research and convening platform that was founded in 2017 now with another consulting firm uh, named M plus D, and I'd like to thank my partners, Sean McManus and Brett Dobbs, who are listening in. I hope they better be right now for that. We are focused on expanding private giving to the arts and culture and developing new models for impact-driven investment into the cultural sector. We started this platform because we were noticing through research that next generation donors and funders were turning away from the arts to other causes of social impact, particularly social justice, climate justice, racial justice, and other areas such as public health. And we were noticing this way before the events of 2020 upended our lives and accelerated a lot of these causes that this next generation were invested in. So the pandemic, obviously, the pandemic-induced economic instability and a growing social justice movement across the globe. So I'm really happy to have this conversation today at this moment where, I mean, I don't want to say we're coming out of it, but we're definitely in some forward momentum and we're able to look back over the uh, events of the last year and a half, be able to contextualize it a little bit and prepare ourselves for moving forward. And I think what we can all agree uh, with on this, agree to on this stage is that we are in desperate need of new paradigms for almost everything, but particularly in how do we support creatives and artists, and how do we fund the arts. Um, I've been thinking a lot over the summer about a report that came out this past June, which is called the Giving USA Report. It's an annual report that assesses all charitable giving in the United States, and it's the longest running study of its kind. And uh, charitable giving broke records over 2020. A lot of us were anxiously anticipating this because we were curious about the impacts of the pandemic on charitable giving and how that shifted things. Well, charitable giving increased by over 5% from the year before to $471 billion. And the way that Giving USA looks at this is they break the sectors down into nine different sectors. Seven of those nine sectors experienced growth in 2020. Two did not. One that did not, which is kind of counterintuitive, is health. And the reason for that is a lot of these organizations that advocate for um, solutions to uh, and medicine for disease and disease advocacy are the gathering model, the runs, the walks, et cetera. They saw a dip because they couldn't gather. They saw a dip of around 5%. 
the other sector that saw a decrease was our, our sector, arts and culture. When adjusted for inflation, it decreased by eight, over 8%. Eight and so that's showing us a lot of things. That's showing us the, that we didn't necessarily make a case as a sector over the course of the pandemic that the arts matter, why they matter, and how to fund them appropriately, and that people are indeed increasingly turning to other areas for their giving. So what was already a problem is now a crisis, and it's imperative for us to rethink how, do we, how we fund the arts. And I am overjoyed to be joined by these three experts who I turn to to learn about what's going on out there with me today, who I know will share their insight with you and provide ideas for new models, both for investors and also for creative entrepreneurs. So I don't wanna ask, I don't wanna read a bio and I don't wanna ask them to recite their bio. So I'd like to just start by asking you guys, we'll start with Jonathan here, sort of what's your philosophy with regards to creative entrepreneurship and how do you approach your work? Tough questions first. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Melissa. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'm really honored to share the stage uh, with Whitney and Jeremiah, um, uh, who are gonna have much better answers to this question than I have, uh, both because they're far more intelligent and active and also because they're having time to think about what the answer is right now. Um, so I'd say my philosophy is just sh very short, um, and I'll, there'll be more time to elaborate on this, but my sense is that artists need capital, they need time and they need support and access to networks in order to do the best work that they need to be able to do or that they want to be able to do. And our institutions have been relied upon to provide that capital and that time and support, but over time as those institutions have aged and evolved, they're not doing quite the job that they need to be doing any longer. And I think that the nonprofit sector is one place that does an exceptional job has amazing people working in it, has wonderful histories, a lot of institutional memory, and a lot of importance to, to bring to bear on the art and cultural sector at large. Um, but it's time for new institutions, it's time for experimentation, it's time for a lot more flexibility, and I think we're at the moment where we can begin to see that. It's not gonna happen inside of these, these big institutions or even some of the small ones, it's gonna happen on the ground with artist-led operations, with people like Whitney and Jeremiah um, as they begin to think about new models and new ways of developing the art and cultural sector from the ground up, which means doing away with categories like commercial and nonprofit, visual and performing arts and whatever else, let the creativity lead the way, and everybody else needs to fall in line and support what the artists have to do. I love that. Um, really picking, piggybacking off of what you just said, a lot of what I look at in the philosophy of where arts and creatives fit into our community or our ecosystem, as I, I oftentimes like to say is, we need to elevate where that fits. As much as we put our Fortune 500 and our Fortune 100 companies, we have to see that within community development and within economic development, there's all also the creatives in the arts and we have not allocated funding, we haven't allocated capital, we haven't allocated resources to that. And that is what people move to cities for. And I think we discovered that even more during 2020 um, when we could look at what is remote work and what are the cities we choose to live in. So a lot of the work that I do in Memphis and really just nationally in connecting cities that are underrepresented is saying, how do we connect capital and resources um, to that? How do we connect people to those individuals in those cities in order to elevate it? How do we say that as much as we love our entrepreneurs, right, we consider our artists and our creatives as entrepreneurs as well? And how do we get artists and creatives to see themselves within entrepreneurship? So that's a lot of the work that I do um, from a city that is not in New York, that is not in LA, um, you have to find those components and, and you have to have the city invest in those components in order for those artists to elevate. So it's really taking the silos and the boundaries that we've seen for so long away in order for us to really see innovation continue to grow. So a lot of my philosophy falls under, let's eliminate these boundaries. Let's continue to look at 
artists and creatives as entrepreneurs and elevate that. What do you got, Jeremiah? Thank you so much. Actually, to, again, piggyback off of some of the things you said, uh, my work is very granular. I spend most of my time in the studios with visual artists, uh, specifically and really exclusively uh, with artists of African descent, um, African American here in the States, in the diaspora outside of the continent, and also on the continent. And with it, I spend a majority of my time just listening um, and observing habits, rituals, and production. Um, these are all things that are centric to all of us as human beings. And if we get, begin to understand our habits, our rituals, um, we'll be able to maximize our production, yeah. right? And then also look at those rhythms and those patterns. You know, we're in a data-centric world where we're able to aggregate our habits together and then we have a common value or a common shared identity and we're able to drive that energy towards something, yeah. whether it be capital, whether yeah. it be uh, an institution or shifting the paradigm, but you have to build community by first shifting the language, the nomenclature. Right. You know, there's so many artists who don't think of themselves as entrepreneurs, and a lot of the work that I do within the studio is getting them to understand a lot of their transferable skills, right? Because if you're a sculptor and you work with wood, uh, you can do a lot of carpentry work, right? There's income and grant opportunities related to that but if you're just looking for a grant opportunity or a residency that specifically um, is you know, generalized for artists, you're missing out on so many other things that could trickle down and really grow your practice. See why I like them so much? Um, thank you both, thank you all for starting us off. Gosh, there's so many places we could go. Um, I want, I'm thinking back to when we did, when the four of us spoke a few weeks ago and I asked you all to reflect on really what's on your mind right now. What are you seeing right now that you're thinking about on an everyday basis? And what came up is what's come up for all of us, which is how do we better leverage technology? Um, how can creative entrepreneurs better leverage technology? How can investors in arts and culture better leverage technology? And I think it's a good place to start because it's going to lead us into a lot of different areas. And you, so, you just touched upon that, Jeremiah, with... Um, how do you work with creatives? How do you get to how do you get them to see themselves as entrepreneurs? One of the questions I've been getting from friends and colleagues when I they said you know this panel is what differentiates an entrepreneur from a creative entrepreneur? And so I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit, but then also speak to us about how have you worked with your artists to leverage technology over this last year to break down barriers and how's that going? Yeah, uh, great question. Yeah, uh, technology is paramount. Um, it's accelerating at a pace faster than we've ever seen in, in modern history. And um, I think it's critically important for particularly ent uh, entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs, artists, and that whole uh, group of people to really understand that you can leverage it at any level, right? So many people have, uh, out there are now joining us via live stream and being able to tap into this conversation for multiple reasons. Maybe you couldn't make it, you're out of town, you could be a family member, hi mom. Um, <laughs> but this is an opportunity, much like going to a university, right, and learning. Um, and I think the distinction between a creative entrepreneur and an entrepreneur is the pathway and understanding kind of the methodology behind it. So much of how I've seen it kind of oscillating, vacillating between, you know, uh, being a practicing artist and uh, an art business professional is understanding the methodology. And part of that is if you're looking at those habits and those rituals, they may be different from, you know, uh, and someone who owns a hedge fund or someone who owns a, a laundromat. They're both entrepreneurs, but in order to uh, understand what a business is, there are certain elements that are fundamental for sustainability. And I think that's where the distinction is many creative entrepreneurs don't think about sustainability. They're thinking about survival, right? Uh, particularly within my community, majority of black cultural practitioners are trying to make just enough to sustain themselves uh, for that day, for that week, to pay rent, you know? But an entrepreneur is looking at first and second quarter earnings, looking where they can invest, hire, scale what they're doing. So part of it is for myself to begin to have those conversations, give them examples of what successful creative entrepreneurship looks like, 
Uh, a great example is an artist I've worked with for a number of years, uh, Jamal Barber. Um, he's a, a printmaker, uh, Leno cuts on paper, um, starts to do painting, just recently got his MFA at Georgia State. Really talented brother, very well connected. He's one of those artist artists, right? If you want to know something or someone else, you talk to him. Well, he started a podcast, right? And like so many other people, he's out there, he's having those conversations, but he targeted to his group of, of friends and the community that he knew the best. And that has grown so many other entrepreneurial opportunities for him where they're able to invest in his ideas going beyond just the studio space. But part of it was he was using a transferable skill, his relationship, um, the way he would engage. He's an excellent marketer. I mean, the way that he's on social media and marketing his own shows, it's really better than the galleries and the culture institutions that you know, produce them for him. So I think part of it is getting them to understand and um, even though this word sometimes is not used uh, in a way that I like, but empower them or enlighten them or really remind them. Because I think there, there's a core principle within all of us uh, and an undying spirit to make, create, and manifest. And if we understand the process, the habits, the rituals, and the production, we could say we're not too far away from the CEO we see in Wall Street or on East 52nd or wherever, right? But part of it is not separating ourselves from that, but saying, hey, I have those same habits and rituals so I can be successful too, because success is about support. Yeah, just to, to piggyback off of that, I mean, you, you explained it perfectly. One of the things I, I realized with artists was, and, and even with the other side, right, our governments and our chamber was not understanding this linkage, right? So you have artists that have ideas. And if I, if I take it for a second, because sometimes I think when we talk about art, and since we're all in art, we take it very personal, and so then we all of a sudden, like, we get really tight, and we're like, oh, you're about to talk about us, right? So let me move it, let me move it out, and let me move it to some science, right? So you have a scientist that comes up with an idea, right? They've been studying theory. They've come up with what, what, what are the things with molecules and et cetera. But you have to turn that idea into a product right, in order for them to continue to grow, that sustainability idea. So it's, it's coming up with a patent, it's oftentimes coming up with a product after that, right? And so I think what 2020 really taught us, and to, to a lot of what you just said, was that we came from saying that this idea is more than just an idea, but we can turn it into a, a thing. We can package it and turn it into experiences, whether we're seeing it as experiential, um, exhibitions in which we see with brands, or we see it in terms of the exhibitions that we see in galleries. How do we package this product, this idea, into something that we can now sell? Maybe, and I know this word is, is, is not the, the best one, but how do we commercialize it, right? And so I had to talk to a lot of chambers about how do we turn you investing into the creative economy into a piece of economic development? People move into cities because of what the creatives have packaged. What have they, what have they brought together in terms of the ideas to make people feel a sense of place, but also their own ideas, what have they brought for your city? And so I think that's a big part of what technology brought to us was this accessibility of turning our ideas into a product that other people could consume. And I think that's a big part of what we saw in 2020. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I was gonna <clears throat> hop on that just a, a second too. I love this, uh, this analogy to the scientist, uh, and especially because most scientists make their living inside of the research university. And research universities have, for the last at least 30, 40 years, many of them have departments of tech transfer, especially for their computer scientists and their engineers that take the basic science that a lot of their engineers and their scientists are doing and package it and produce it in a way that can become available to 
<coughs> commercialization, largely through venture capital and other types of things, but they do all of that work to support the work that those artists are doing, right? We don't do that in the arts in the same way. We don't have people who are actively looking for ways to take the really interesting projects the artist might be doing in their studio, which might qualify as like basic research, right? It's like the cutting edge of the avant-garde of the work that they're doing, and then someone might turn around and say, hey, there are a bunch of different opportunities of things that we could do with this. Yeah. Let's figure out other ways of bringing capital to it. Let's figure out other audiences that we might be able to reach to it. Some, and, and the problem is, and this is the culture of the arts that we have, is that the artist is like, oh, no, like that's going to compromise my vision, or it's going to be a sellout thing, or people are not going to think I'm serious any longer. And that happens in the sciences, too. Yeah. You have basic research scientists who make a huge name for themselves, have incredible reputations inside of their fields, and then they write a popular book. And all of their colleagues are like, ew, like, don't come to the faculty meeting anymore, right. dude, because now you've got a best-selling book, right? Like, you're Brian Greene, even though you've done great stuff in string theory. So, but we've got to get over that. Yeah. And, you know, the sciences at a certain level are starting to get over that, too. They're realizing, like, hey, listen, we're, you know, it's one thing to go out and get a big NSF grant. It's another thing to, like, you know, popularize the work that we're doing so people realize, like, oh, my God, like, you know, we ran this amazing experiment that demonstrated that graviton, you know, the, the, like the gravity fields are real and proved what Einstein theoretically thought, you know, 100 years ago. And, you know, amazing stuff. Let's bring that to the public so that it can be in the New York Times. When was the last time you saw, you know, someone doing that for major artists on a regular basis, right? It's like every once in a while you get like, oh, there's a big show at the Museum of Modern Art. Wow. Right? Like, that, I'm not yeah. poo-pooing it. I'm saying, like, that's amazing. But that's the only pathway right now that and that's the only pathway that most artists are looking at right like this is like the definition of success is like oh i want a retrospective at the studio museum in 30 years i want you know this recognition from these institutions and you're like okay that's great but that doesn't have to be the measure of success for every artist right and there's got to be other pathways it such a great point, and I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of the work that I do is career mapping for artists, right? Because we are what we see, right? And, and so much of the New York Times and publications, it's like I want to be that artist. Uh, part of the work that I have done over the last five years is getting artists to understand their end game. Like, why are you doing this? Why do you make what you make? Who do you want to see it? Who is your audience, right? So I'm using all this language around the object and the ideas embedded the objects themselves, but they turn into business plans, right? Because it's market research once you understand your audience. But it's value centric. So I'm not telling them, oh, well, you now have to make this work for such and such curator, gallerist, or museum. Like, what are you trying to communicate? Who is that audience? Who needs to see this? Is this, are you talking to a younger version of yourself, which is many artists, you know? trying to create a world, a euphoria, um, that they can dream up through this, this object, this paint, this color, this texture, this form. So if, if we look at these uh, alternative examples that parallel, really, just like the scientist is a great example because most artists are in the studio doing the scientific process anyway, right? They're trying to innovate on their materials, pushing their bodies in performance, their, you know, mixing various different chemicals with acrylic and oil to, you know, do all these really amazing things. I mean, we're seeing it outside of these walls here. So how do we think more critically about uh, multiple examples of what success looks like and sustainable success, right? Because if we just look at a Kerry James Marshall or, you know, an Andy Warhol, that many of them got successful at the end of their life or after they have passed. Let's begin to look at other transferable skills and other pathways of what success looks like that are centric to the values of the artist and the community that they're ultimately inspired to create work out of. It's so interesting, Jeremiah, because I'm listening to you talk and you know, there's the assumption that a lot of this training, a lot of this work, a lot of this conversation happens within the academy. So we have an academic here. So I want to ask you, you know, is this training happening within the academy? How is the academy doing and talking to artists the way these two brilliant people next to you are talking to artists? Such a loaded question. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm of two minds on this, right? I'm a creature of the academy. I have a deep, deep, deep love for these institutions. I think that, 
you know, if there's one thing that, that the United States has going on the, the rest of the planet, it is the, the scale and the quality and the excellence of many of our universities and the, 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 the intellectual knowledge production that goes on in these places, right? The, ki the kinds of dialogues and the kinds of conversations that really can't happen anywhere else. Within art programs, I think for a long time there was they were the, you know the, the the universities were were essential, but the business model has become unsustainable, and the debt service that young artists are being asked to carry in order to get the sort of brand credential that many of these top programs are providing itself is unsustainable. Now there's a lot of there's a lot of financial support and there's a lot of stuff that goes behind it, but it's still, for most people, just an unsustainable business model. Um, at the same time, the market signals show that having one of these really well-known MFA programs on your CV is a real is a, is a real path to success, right? I mean, I was speaking with a friend who runs a gallery in Los Angeles and, you know, a lot of their artists don't come from trust fund backgrounds and they've had to, you know, beg and, and borrow and steal in order to get through their MFA programs, but they've all got these, like, great MFAs um, and, and they're showing with an excellent gallery in Los Angeles now and, and their careers are on the up and up. So it's hard to say that they're not maybe worth the investment that they're asking the artist to make. I do know that the conversation that happens inside of those programs for the last 30 to 40 years would not touch this conversation, right? Would not look at the idea of the creative entrepreneur or thinking about art and the market and the business and the things that artists need to do. It wouldn't touch it. Right? But that's just a sort of uneven development. Right? I think that that conversation is changing. I think there are artists who are being tapped to teach in the academy who are being much more forthright about the types of pragmatism and the types of strategies that their students need to get involved with. But institutions are slow moving. Mine is slow moving. They're all slow moving. So you have generations of faculty who are still there, who are still holding on to a certain kind of ideological mindset that sees the market as a kind of uh, anathema to creative activity in the studio. And, you know, I'm ambivalent about this point myself. Like, I do think that there's moments where you can't have artists only thinking about what their audience wants to see or only thinking about what collectors want to see or only thinking about what the marketplace is going to validate because there needs to be room and freedom to be able to go in and make mistakes and to innovate and to, you know, to do something different. So, you know, it's, I don't, I don't think that the academy is necessarily where, I don't think that conversation is happening in the academy right now the way it needs to be. I think it will get there, but I think in the meantime, operations like Jeremiah's, operations like Whitney's, operations like Inversion Art will be doing it outside of that institutional framework, and then that will find its way sort of back in, because the universities do a very good job of also absorbing and observing what's happening in the culture and beginning to then reproduce it for their students later on. So that brings up a good point of how do we scale operations like what the two of you have here. And we're in an art fair context. We have our ecosystem as it is right now. How can we best utilize it and leverage these moments to promote the expansion of these sustainable models? And Whitney, you've done this, so I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about Young Collectors Contemporary. No, that's, uh, that's perfect, um, because when we look at the typical art fair model, we have to look at who's being excluded. And when I first collect, uh, started Young Collectors Contemporary, it was looking at what are tell the- us what it, Tell us what it is. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, Melissa. This is, why you're the, this is why she's the best moderator. <laughs> so Young Collectors Contemporary is an annual art fair that brings together underrepresented um, individuals from, and, and underrepresented isn't just a, a demographic of are you just black, are you LGBT, but also cities, right? Non-coastal cities where artists reside, um, right? How do we bring them together so that they can receive the resources they need in order to thrive, right? And thrive is so overused as a, as a term. But when I say thrive, I mean, how do we make sure that they have access to the curators, the interior designers, the critics, right? The collectors, both new and old, um, that have been collecting work. 
So we created this art fair and brought them all together. And in order to do that, we had to say, what are the things that stop them from success? And a lot of the things that stopped them from success was really, I mean, as simple as it sounds, it's just getting there, right? And getting there means the airfare, the hotel, the booth, right? That the essentials, right? The things that oftentimes they don't have access to. So we made an art fair that did just that inside of, of, of Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and we brought together folks from Baltimore, Detroit, New Orleans, rural areas around Midwest, Pacific Northwest, and different areas, and brought them all to Memphis to do that. And so when we looked at how, how do you scale this, we had to look at all of those different components. Right? You can be a great artist, but if you're missing the network, you're stuck where you are. The network is probably the most valuable thing that you can have. I think we all know that. It like, doesn't matter where you go to college if you don't have the network. Right? Like, part of why your parents send you to private school is because the network you're going to get when you go there. It's not just the education. And so they, we created that art fair to do just that, is how do we make this network something that is accessible to individuals that haven't had access to that. And then on the flip side of it, right, the, those that are buying the work, how do we make sure that they can actually buy the work, right? And if we look at what finance is doing right now, um, I'm a millennial, I know student debt is huge, Nobody wants any more interest charges. We ain't putting none of us on our credit cards. They are maxed out just on getting our rent. So we needed to find a way to buy that art and buy it in a way that we could actually buy into, right? How do we stop the amount of debt we're accruing but keep investing into economic development, investing into our local artists or other artists? Um, and so just, just piggybacking off of what you're saying is that they haven't taught business skills in academia, right? So when we created this art fair, I, I, I will tell you that artists were like, oh, I need to be friends with interior designers. Yeah. I need to be friends with those that are doing all of this uh, uh, development in my city. So, I mean, uh, whether they're building a new hotel or a new uh, anything, making new carpet, right? Like, those designs came from artists, and the artists weren't taught that those were also our customers. We were just told, oh, the only customers we have are within galleries, when really you have this huge amount of customer base that it is. I mean, everything you look at, whether it's the pattern on my sweater, it came from an artist. But we aren't teaching that in our MFA programs. We're not teaching that in undergrad. And so even the sustainability of some of our MFA programs are at risk. Coming from Memphis, Tennessee, we had a, a school called Memphis, the Memphis College of Art. It closed. It's been closed for the last two years, right? And it's, it's been very heartbreaking for the alumni of artists that have graduated because they're like, oh, I thought, I thought this school was going to last forever. But really it was, well, they didn't put the business skills in here for the alumni to start reinvesting back and also to recruit back into those creative industries, right? How do we elevate those creative industries and those creative sectors beyond just, just the gallery model, right? And I think a lot of the art fairs that were originally created were just like, it's just for galleries and not seeing that um, we have St. Jude Research Hospital in Memphis, right? And one of the things that we did during, um, I founded Memphis Art and Design Week. It didn't exist before I created it. Um, and when I created Memphis Art and Design Week, I said, I want to pull every industry cluster together, right? So we're a logistic city. We have St. Jude here. What is happening inside of those areas in the art world that we aren't talking about? And what I discovered even from St. Jude, right, is that children don't leave the hospital at St. Jude. I, mean, I think y'all know that, right? Like, just based off of what St. Jude is. But it took a, a group that did coding, called Code Crew, and some artists to come together to say, how do we make these walls, these blank walls, into something that when the kids can just walk around the, the area, they can enjoy? 
but artists weren't thinking about that when they're in their MFA program, right? They're not thinking about how do I connect with hospitals, those that don't feel well, to create a sense of place, right? And those are, those are also your customers, but we aren't taught that information. And I think academia, in a big way of what, what Jonathan has talked about, has had to remove those, those barriers of saying that all we have is that when the artists graduate, they'll be in a gallery, or they'll just be artists and they'll, they'll figure it out. It's saying we can connect to the industries within our cities to create pathways of sustainability for those artists to thrive. And that's largely of what I've tried to do is try to get the chambers and the corporate organizations and et cetera to see where they fit within the budget that they have to make it a better system for artists. So I think that's a big piece. And I'll just, I'll just briefly, and then I want to throw this over to Jeremiah, but <clears throat> we should also say that like not every MFA program needs to be this, the same, yeah. right? And that, and that, um, and that right now is a, is a moment of massive transformation, especially in higher education and graduate education. Everybody is rethinking what their models are. Everyone's rethinking who their audiences are. Everyone's rethinking how stuff is delivered and what outcomes are. And so now is a time, I mean, I can say it from inside of my own institutions and, and other colleagues and others, I mean, this is firmly on the table, right? Um, and so I still, I, you know, for those who, who hear, you know, academia and the university and the MFA program and still sort of hold to this old school idea about there needs to be a place where the kind of highest ideals or the most sort of avant-garde thinking or research can go on within a within a within a, a an art program or an art and aesthetics and research and theory program however you want to think it that can exist Right? It just does not have to be reproduced at every single university. Right? Right. And yeah. there was a moment where every university tried to do that with one another. Right? They all sort of proliferated the same model. And I think that what we have is a real lack of diversity of thought in those programs. Again, that's beginning to change. And so what you're going to get, I think, are programs where, you know, because listen, I went to architecture school and it's the same thing. Everyone comes out thinking that you're going to be like, you know, Mies van der Rohe or Frank Gehry or something like that. And that's like the ideal and everything that you're looking at and everything that, you know, it's like, I thought it was going to be Tom Main of Morphosis, right? And it was like, you know, pouring through t Morphosis books left and right and being like, this is amazing. I want to build these types of buildings, you know, and then my first job out of architecture school is basically six months of picking out doorknobs in a suites catalog. And I'm like, <laughs> well, this sucks. See you later. Going back to the academy where it was fun, right? right. And so I went got back a PhD. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and so now like 20 years later, I'm like, well, there needed to be another option. Right? And, and I think that there are a lot of artists who feel the same frustrations, um, but at the same time are nourished by the intellectual work and the intellectual ideas and the, you know, the, the vibrancy of the studio and their peers and all those things that happen. And no one wants to take that away and no one's discounting that, but there has to be room to validate the, the space for then those artists to go in. We gave a name to it called social practice for the last like five years um, or longer. But even there, it was, it was meant to be a kind of like, uh, you know, a, 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 a version of, of a kind of like Robert Smithson non-place avant-garde activity, not just, you know, art as service to a community. And I think that's beginning to change now too. Yeah. Anyway. And you're merging the two. I mean, your business and how you work with these artists is really bringing together both components of what Jonathan was talking about and you're seeing the success through that, and it's clicking, and it's working, and it's needed. Very much so. I mean, um, the, the spirit of creativity is to pervert the line. It doesn't need to be straight. Swiggle a little bit and see what happens. Throw some paint on the floor, right? So if that is the natural kind of uh, intuitive spirit of being in the studio to experiment and to see what happens, can we not use that same spirit to create a business model or business models of that same habit, ritual, to improve that production? So much of my work, and I keep on talking about the same thing, is just observe the artist, right? If, if we listen and we watch the patterns of, of making things, there's so much more we can learn about how to support them for, versus top down, right? Taking this big picture ID, idea that's bureaucratic and a thousand people who haven't been in the studio um, to now give you what they think should be created or the prevailing aesthetic or what is good art, right? So 
when I think about uh, the work that I do and how I try and combine both models is really looking at multiple examples. So defining that end game very early on, right? What are the things that'll make you whole and complete? There are so many artists I work with who are very talented in multiple things and they just so happen to choose being a practicing artist. And when they do that, they still have other aspirations and other things that they want to do, build cars or fun, uh, real estate. A lot of artists that I work with, as they're coming into more wealth or resources, they're purchasing homes, they're purchasing their studio, but we're also having conversations about their, you know, their means of production, right? And if they're spending $50,000 on canvases every year, maybe there's a business opportunity because you're an artist artist and you know another 200 artists you went to school with that are doing pretty well who are spending X number of dollars on canvases. How about you guys just create a canvas company? You have the resources, you have the space. So we're beginning to think about these things differently and having these conversations early on because once you find that end game, you know, <laughs> it reminds me of something that I, I, I love doing so much and I, I feel like a proud parent because I have like three or four artists who have either solo booths or presentations here at the fair. And I remember when, you know, these paintings were an aloof idea of sorts and defining their end game and understanding the benchmarks of where they wanted to go helped them navigate what opportunities to pursue, right? Uh, the name of my business is Ile Kunwa. It's Yoruba for our door, right? And the door is such a great example for me and kind of the philosophical architecture of the work that I do because a door is liminal. It's both outside and inside. No one person or artist is just a painter. If you see their painting, I'm pretty sure they've sculpted, they did photography, they did film. You know, they've done all of these things. They just probably just chose one or built an audience around one particular uh, media. So I think the important thing is to find and understand, uh, discover, and clarify what their end game is and then build a career roadmap that is flexible because entrepreneurship is about flexibility. It's reading the data, understanding your audience, your community, the marketplace, quote unquote, and again, perverting that line. Don't make it straight. Squiggle a little bit and keep going. We need a, we need a bag or something that says squiggle a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was about to tap you and say, see, like, we got to get him like a graphic designer. I know. I mean, seriously. Making, making posters and stuff like that. <laughs> like, we, we should be selling, selling shirts. Um, I mean, and it's simply, I just wanted to say like just a simple phrase after that. It's an appetite for innovation yeah. that we have to invest in, right? And, that, and that's all I wanted to say. That's it. The appetite for innovation. But I, but I wanted that's to good. add to that. And it was, I was thinking about it earlier when you were talking that there's all, there's, this is another thing that differentiates the academy or differentiates the nonprofit and the, and, the, and the commercial space. And we're talking a lot about entrepreneurship. We're talking a lot about innovation. We're talking a lot about investment. We're talking a lot about capital. And these are terms that are just have, have historically been sort of frowned upon within the art and cultural sector. It's just not a language that anyone's comfortable with inside of that space. One of the things that you find when you talk to people in the tech industry or the venture capital industry or you know, founders who are starting new businesses is there's a lot of failure, right? And I don't mean to glorify this sense of failure. I don't mean to you know, think that this is like, oh, we have to fail better, fail faster, all this kind of nonsense. It became kind of stupid. But what there is is there is a much bigger appetite for risk yeah. and there's a much bigger appetite on a certain level with, with, with investors understanding that that money may never come to anything, they may never see a return. Yeah. Yeah. The nonprofit sector cannot stand that. Anybody who gives their money to an institution wants to know that their money is being put to good use and now they Impact. want even more accounting of where that money is going to and nobody within the nonprofit sector feels at all any capacity to take money that's coming in and think about it as you know, doing something experimental, trying a bunch of different things, seeing how it sticks against the wall. There is so little appetite for risk because the money and the capital is so tightly bound up with this relationship with donors, with funders. Um, and okay, that's understandable, but there has to be another place where capital can flow into organizations and to people at the creative industry and artists who are gonna try things that are gonna fail miserably and are not gonna have any impact and it's not gonna go anywhere, but you can't function 
as an effective artist without the room to move, without those degrees of freedom and without some, without some capital destruction. I hate to say it, right? Some, sometimes that happens, and it happens in the, in the startup landscape all the time. It does not happen in the nonprofit landscape necessarily because it's, everything is about going to salaries. I think more of it should go to salaries. Um, but it's all about you know, going to, I mean, it, it, I, you could get me started on this whole thing about you know, not funding operations and museums. I mean, my God, we'll be here for like an hour and a half and I'll have to be dragged out of here. Um, but you know, the, the, the idea that, the, that this money is, is going for very specific purposes, they want to see it for programming of a very specific type, it's got to go away. Right? You gotta hand that money over, you gotta see what the people have in, 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 as an idea, and then let them free to do it, right? Let them produce it and then see what comes afterwards. Know what you want your returns to look like, know what you want your impact to look like, try and reach those benchmarks. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, right? right? But, you know, anybody who's familiar with the sort of venture capital world, you know, they want a 10% success rate, yeah. Yeah. right? And the nonprofit landscape wants like a 99% success rate. It's right. not feasible. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit more and get a little more prescriptive about the investors because we spent a good amount of time talking about the creatives themselves. But in order to change the models and change this way we've been doing business, and I think everyone here agrees we need a new way of doing business, um, how can we create a strategic, accountable, community-focused investor base in the arts and when it comes to creative entrepreneurs? And we're going to go right back to you, Jonathan. <laughs> and tell us what Inversion Art is doing to help move that needle forward. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak about it. I'll, I'll introduce that briefly and then try and answer this other question. So Inversion Art is a new venture uh, that I'm building um, with a co-founder that is going to do a lot of the sort of same things that, that Jeremiah is, is, has, is thinking about. We, we definitely see eye to eye um, on the, the idea that artists really need to think strategically about where their careers are going. They need a business plan. They need a five-year plan. They need to think about what success is to them and how they want to define it, and that's going to be different for every artist who comes in. But then those artists need money, and they need time, and they need, most importantly, access to networks of people, both inside and outside the art industry, to help them realize those plans. And they need to be very thoughtful and think about what are the steps they need to take to get there. So, for example, you're talking about if there's, you know, many artists wait to be successful before they get approached by an interior designer or a fashion label who just happens to have seen their work and then they say, oh, hey, let's do a collaboration. They're like, oh, that would be great. Thanks so much for thinking about me. I think that we all agree that needs to be flipped, right? The artists need to be the ones who are going out there and saying, hey, you know, I like your fashion label. I like the music that you're making. I like this, you know, I like this community development program. I want to help. Here's what I do. How can I get involved? Let's figure out a collaboration. Now, the other thing that we do is that artists suck at talking about their own work. <laughs> Often, sorry. Um, Mostly, no one likes to talk about themselves. No one likes to advocate for themselves. Most people don't. There are people out there who do like to do it. But a lot of people need an advocate. A lot of people need an agent. A lot of people need somebody else to be making those connections and doing that work for them on their behalf. And that's the other thing that, that we are doing. Now, my sense is that we are going out and looking for people, you know, both in the arts, collectors, investors, uh, trustees of museums, technologists, people from the venture capital community, people from accelerator communities, um, but who are really interested in simply this, in new models and new ways of, of putting capital into the hands of innovative, interesting, creative people and seeing what comes of it. We're just happy to be building a model where there may be returns for them in the back end as well. The success of the artists means success for those investors as well. And I don't think that that's anathema. For a long time, it's thought to be to have been. The model that we have is that you want to invest in the talent. You're not investing in the product of the talent necessarily, right? And I think this is one thing that differentiates what we do from the galleries. We want to be really good partners to galleries. Galleries are sales platforms. There are many more sales platforms. They are invested in the product. Their clients are institutions, collectors, the people who want to buy those products, the artists, for lack of a better word, are suppliers, and the suppliers need better representation in this field. 
And I think that's, you know, I think we all agree that that's sort of where we 100%. are. And we think that, we think that there are people in the business landscape and also in the arts landscape who will recognize that and will think, hey, here's a way of bringing new capital and new attention into this field um, in a way that, you know, is in their, both their own self-interest, but also in the best interest of the artists that we're working with. Whitney, you do this in Memphis, and Third Space has been really successful in messaging the artist, artistic supporter as investor and linking that to economic development within the city. So how does this resonate with you, and what have you seen in terms of success with young next-gen investors in Memphis in the cultural economy? No, that, that's perfect. Um, and I think the big word here is, is sustainability, right? We had, uh, what we learned in 2020 is we had these, these big institutions that were out here and they were, I mean, using up a lot of the arts capital in order to survive. And then 2020 happened and we were like, okay, what about that arts organization that's situated within our neighborhood that is not getting the same amount of capital as this larger institution, right? And so what we had to break down was this idea of like stacking capital. And that's what I've tried to really back into was how do we, how do we stack the capital opportunities that we're providing for the arts um, in the same way that we provide for entrepreneurs, right? So what that means is how do we look at grants, which is free money, right? That's, that's something that someone's just giving to you. It's non-diluted. It's, it's, you don't take any really ownership. It's you've won a prize, you get the money, you get to create, right? And then what are we doing in terms of loans, banks, all that stuff, so that if you wanted to create the Museum of Ice Cream as a creative, what do you need to do in order to get access to loans and funds in order to grow your practice to that point, right? And so you have to continue doing that. And what we discovered in 2020 is that we've put the arts in a place where we didn't make it sustainable. We have made museums dependent completely on free money, right? That's not sustainable. So in trying to continue to put the dollars toward the museums, we have neglected the community businesses, those that are creating the ideas like Braun. A lot of you guys have beards. I can't tell, y'all got masks on, I'm making it up. I think y'all got beards but y'all shave, right? And Braun being behind design, right? What if we couldn't invest into the fact that we're making a new clipper, right? You ha in order to fund innovation, you have to quit funding the thing that you've been funding for the last 20 years, because it's sucking up all the money. That's right. It's sucking it all up. I can't continue funding the new ideas in my city if I'm still putting all of that money towards a museum or an institution of any sort that hasn't also figured out some at least 50%, 40%, whatever, of, of being able to be around. So I have emphasized this idea of stacking the opportunities for capital for artists and removing the ones that we have continued to put for the last 20 or 30 years towards the same big institutions that aren't actually doing the community work because they're not, they're, they're, they should be funding those that are actually in the community at this point doing that work, but we aren't seeing the m money move that way. Um, so we have to reallocate. I think uh, Mayor uh, Muriel Bowser in DC exemplified this a lot when she decided, hey, we're gonna move some of this money from just going towards the big institutions to being allocated towards some of the community businesses. And people were in an uproar about this, right? Like, it's crazy. It's like, oh, no, no, no. We just want the big museums and the big institutions outside of, of federally funded to be funded. And you're like, okay, but what about the ones that are actually in our Latinx communities, that are actually within our black communities, would, would actually serve in the LGBT community, which are in this impoverished neighborhood? They would have gotten zilch but they've had to figure out for the last X number of years to be around. But now during COVID, we're allocating all the funds and the grants only towards the big groups and not towards the little ones, right? That's not providing them opportunities to even grow to be a bigger institution. And honestly, you want them to be able to grow. 
You have to have room, capital, appetite, network, uh, people, talent. You have to fund that and empower that within your city, not forever, right, on the same individual, but over time create this pipeline for them to move to the next category. Because if not, you're just not gonna be sustainable as a city and as a creative industry. Jeremiah, what are you seeing with the artists that you work with and those that are seeking to fund and invest in those artists in a completely different way? What story is most resonating? Like, what's the hook for those investors who wanna come in and fund and support those artists differently than the traditional model? Yeah, um, values. Uh, so much of the work that I do is value-centric. There's a particular reason why I'm wearing this shirt. It was made in the same town and village my mother was born. Uh, so people who see it recognize a certain element about me and what I value, right? Go to war, suit and tie, whatever. Um, it's the same thing with artwork. Anytime you approach a painting, you bring all your assumptions, your pain, uh, someone who cut you off on the street to that painting. Right? Uh, so it's the same way. I try and bring collectors, investors, community uh, advocates, turn them into ambassadors by getting them to understand and recognize what they value about the artist, right? Because it's the idea embedded in the object, not the object itself. So, how do we now be critically honest about the things that we value and how we project those? things onto objects and build a community out of that. It's, it doesn't have to be packaged as marketing or building a product, which I think are very important things. But again, uh, the role that I play is the language, right? Because I've been a practicing artist before, and you get touchy about your stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like someone uses the wrong type of language to describe something you spent six months creating, you're living, right? So in understanding that and listening to the artist, it's helping them and better equipping them to articulate. To Jonathan's point, many artists don't know how to talk to communities outside of academia, especially if you're an MFA. Like the way you're describing your painting is going to get, you know, a VC guy nervous. He's gonna be like, nah, I don't know what he's saying, and move on, right? So how do I now connect to something um, more centric about uh, commonality, whether it's community, uh, something that uh, they share, if it's a piece of work or a sculpture or something that's recognizable based on the region or maybe faith or cultural background or other affinity groups, begin the conversation there and it begins to open things up. Um, because, and Jonathan can definitely speak to this much better than I can, but majority of the VC community, they're investing in people they believe in, not their idea. There are a thousand ideas out there, but they're like, all right, this person works so hard, I can commit some capital and know that even if it fails, this person put everything they could into making it happen. And that is a value-based connection, and that's what I try and do with the artists that I work with. Wonderful. I have a closing question for the three of you, but I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So if there are any questions from the audience, speak up. And we have Aisha has the mic. Um, so you guys have talked a lot about sort of adjacent industries, so creative adjacent industries like um, banking and lending institutions. Um, I actually work for a boutique insurance firm, um, and our area of focus historically has been collectors, high net worth individuals. Um, you know, if I have a collector who wants me to insure a million dollar painting, I can do it sitting at my desk, no problem, it's easy. I have seven markets that'll bend over backwards. Um, ask me to do that for an artist who needs me to insure their million dollar artwork. No one wants to touch it. And that experience led me to start working a little bit more with practicing artists, including those who work in public spaces and partnerships with municipalities. Um, and, and it's really been challenging to find markets that are willing to engage with and, and underwrite these risks. 
and they regard them as excessively risky and this notion of you need to commoditize the product in order to make it valuable to others, I'm definitely seeing that. I'd love for you guys, if you feel comfortable doing it though, to call out other industries that are sort of adjacent to artists and, and the creative sector and maybe say some of the industries that you feel could do a better job of engaging and partnering and supporting financially or in other ways, um, particularly public artists and emerging artists. Uh, I will say, you know, hospitality is, is huge. Um, we see a lot of cities starting, I mean, one of the first things we saw in Memphis come into place was more hotels. Right, and um, one of the big things that Young Collectors did was that we ended up selling to a lot of hotel groups um, when we when we had a, our last fair in 2019. Um, so I think hospitality is one that when you move into a city, um, you can invest into those local artists a lot more um, and engage into what that means. Like, are you a collecting institution? As in, are you a collecting hotel group, et cetera, that does that and you can move it to different markets, I think. Organizations like 21C um, have done a good job with that. Um, I, I think banks and insurance have always been one of the big ones that when you go into their offices, you're really impressed. Um, we have a group in Memphis that I won't call them out by name that also is a great um, organization that they're, they're a Fortune 500 company that has an amazing art collection that they just put around their employees, right? So I think it's every industry. I'm, I don't think it's calling out them name by name, but I think every single one of them can invest better and advocate better because they're making their offices someplace that they want their employees to enjoy. And that was the one in, in Memphis that we saw. They were collecting tons of amazing work, but they wanted their employees to live and thrive within that space, like with that art collection. It wasn't something that if, if you didn't go in there, you didn't know it even existed, right? And we, we opened that space up during our art fair for people to try out. Um, but I think everybody can do it um, because that's what you're looking at. Whether it's your bathroom installation, like at your restaurant, like what does that look like? Everybody's taking like selfies in bathrooms now. Like what is the wallpaper? Where's the wallpaper come from? Um, all of that is, there's no excuse anymore. What do you guys think? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think um, so much of a city's identity, at least for myself, you know, when I think about uh, Philadelphia, you know, the city of brotherly love, I think about public art. And the type of art that's there is very accessible and it brings a certain kind of warmth to it. Um, so understanding the larger industries of a city, you know, build kind of its, uh, uh, its economic character of sorts, looking at those cities, because again, um, I don't like to make broad strokes around what should larger industries do, but more so the industries within a city or a region that has a large populace, because I'm very value centric. The things we value here in New York is very different from LA or Miami. So, uh, it's important to look at kind of those, those regional aesthetics or even how weather and how people move and live through space and create uh, opportunities of, of trust and shared values to, uh, to, to build that. There's this thing called cluster theory and it has, uh, you know, it goes back and forth on how people feel about it. Sure. But every city, much to what you said, Jeremiah, was it, every city has their clusters. And I think that if we look at what those clusters are in the city, and then we evaluate how they've invested locally into local business investment, creative businesses, minority businesses, women-owned businesses, we could do better in every single one of those tiers. Um, but cluster theory is, is, I think, a big way of you're saying, whether it's logistics, Memphis is a logistics city, how do we elevate creatives within the logistics space to create new things? Um, or if you're a city that's really big on film and entertainment, how do you make sure that you're allocating towards your local film, uh, local creative industry into your film and entertainment cluster? So I would apply a little bit of cluster theory plus what are we doing within those clusters in these categories to elevate it and we'll see improvements. But all those clusters are different city by city. We had another question that was... 
That, that's you. That's <laughs> Go for you guys. This uh, is hi, the how's it going? Job I've ever had. This is um, so I've been pretty focused on the digital art piece, like with NFTs and things like that, and I've been curious on how you see the art market moving with the new imp implementation of NFTs and all of that, and like revenues and you know that whole world, especially within the academic art section. I intentionally didn't ask them about that earlier because I had money going on. Someone was going to ask that question. Um, I'll take that. So uh, I think that we will see a lot more in this space, obviously. Um, I think that the, the NFT is merely the tip of a spear of a larger sort of technological evolution of distributed ledgers and authentication systems and however trust networks and however you want to think about it. So, you know, I think for every interaction that you have in the, in the establishment art and cultural sector, there is going to be a solution that is going to depend more and more potentially on the sort of underlying technology of this. I think right now NFTs, you know, com because everybody was in the pandemic and, you know, sitting in front of their computers had its sort of like moment in the sun, because um, these have been around much longer than just the last you know, 18 months. Um, but uh, I think the other thing that it's doing, which is great, is that it's expanding the, the, the art world um, and, and sort of enveloping the, the, the sort of boundary, pushing the boundary of what we include within the art world in a really exceptional way, right? I think for a lot of us, you, you know, you spend time in this there are a lot of different art worlds, right? There are a lot of different collector networks. There's a lot of different people who are moving different spaces. The prints and multiples people are not the same as the sort of, you know, high-end evening sale twice a year. Uh, auction people are not the same people as the street art people are not the same people as, you know, there's, you know, there's all of this. NFTs for digital art and for a lot of that work is now just sort of like, brought a bunch of that in and now you've got a lot of really you know artists who've been working in other mediums getting into that and using it a lot of people getting ripped off a lot of you know there's a lot of there's a lot of bad actors but it's like any kind of gold rush moment there are going to be a lot of bad actors i think that again this is one of these places where it's like don't just be a producer and stick your stuff up on OpenSea and hope that you can take advantage of a couple drops this is like how do you build an artist-centric platform right be a platform capitalist be the vectoralist be the person who's going to own that mean of production and do that with a network of your artists and bring that stuff back to your community and i you know frankly i'm really excited to see where it goes um i only trust like three people that i know have been working in this for like a decade to actually talk to me about it because everything else is just like you know 95 percent hot air and five percent you know hustle but that's good i mean i'm like i'm all for it i think it's I think it's I think it's a big I think it's I think it's going to be huge. I think too if you need any more evidence that the next generation is taking over and people are desperate for new ways to invest in the arts, look no further than this. Whether it's sustainable or not, we don't know. Yeah. What it's going to yeah. have, we don't yeah. know, but it's another clear sign that the paradigm is changing, yeah. that people want new ways to invest and as someone who comes out of uh, institutional philanthropy, yeah. you know, you, we always talk about the hook. How do you hook people in? What's the thing that brings them to the table and then how can you engage them further along the lines of your mission, if you're a mission-driven organization, engage them with your artists more. And if NFTs are gonna be that hook that gets someone who's in the crypto world interested in funding the arts and interested in the arts, yeah. well, great, come on through the door and then let's continue the conversation. Yeah, and it's but I think it's a clear sign things are changing and people want things to change. There's comic book artists, there's all of these like, great, I mean, there's this like stuff that's getting recognition that never got recognition yeah. Except by artists, right? I mean, these are people that like artists were looking at and talking to and thinking about. And now all of a sudden, these folks have been working in these digital media that you know were couldn't, you know, couldn't get a gallery show, are now you know doing better than their colleagues are, you know, through OpenSea. But again, you know, another couple flash crashes of eight percent down on Bitcoin and Ether, and you're going to see a lot of that dry up. You know what I mean? Like all of a sudden, those crypto millionaires are going to be like, "Whoa, I became like a." Crypto ten thousand era. <laughs> I've got I've got bills to pay. <laughs> I mean, and even the ripple that's gonna come from NFTs. Like, I always think about. I'm a, I'm a millennial, and so I went from. <laughs> Y'all are like you're a child. Um, <laughs> so I went I. from it's having a Walkman, old. right, to a CD, to having an iPod. 
um, and then now to what we what we have now, right? And there's a lot of accessories that go with all of that, right? And I think we're at the beginning of a hell of a ripple. Um, I think the NFT world is one part, but then if you look at it in the same way that we look at our iPhones, our Android devices, you've got so many things that plug into it that have created a pathway yep. for other creative artists, whether it's Beats by Dre, right? Like they came, he, he as an artist realized I needed better earphones in order to produce in the studio. The same thing is gonna happen with NFTs, right? Yep. I need a better screen than what Samsung is currently producing to show this work in my house. Yep. So I think it's not just gonna be the NFT market, yep. but it's gonna be the ripple of how, what builds on top of that NFT market for people to be able to thrive. And I think there's an investment in both to the art and into what that ripple is that we're gonna see capital be built. And I think creatives should get in on on that. Well said. <laughs> Any last questions? I think we just had the two. Oh, got one more. And thank tell you. us to shut up when it's time to shut up. I know it's time to shut up. <laughs> um, just two quick, quick comments. One is I have a Gen Z son who's an aspiring artist, and he's very concerned about the environmental impacts of NFTs. So speaking to what you were just saying, that will be one thing that they're going to have to address, definitely. Um, the second thing is with Jeremiah, um, I work with a lot of chief communication officers and CEOs of PR firms, chief communication officers in major corporations, and they are very focused on values and their brands, and so it's not just what, what are they producing or what are the products, but really thinking about what are they identifying as their values and connecting the artist's values to what they're working with with the corporate values. So just a comment. I really love this panel, it's excellent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, um, what you said last I think is really important. Well, both things are really important. One, with the uh, environmental impacts around NFTs, the awareness is being spread. So this is kind of the uh, unintended uh, kind of uh, awareness that is, is, is happening as more and more innovation um, is made possible just like COVID and mask, like mask or like a whole industry that no one was investing in, you know? And now we have like 45 different styles of masks that you can buy at a corner store now, right? So no one was thinking of that in, you know, 2019. So uh, it's important to follow, you know, intelligence and uh, because money follows intelligence in that way and innovation and uh, uh, for us to constantly challenge what we understand as the first iteration or, you know, the, uh, the beta. Because I think the, you know, uh, NFTs is still very much the beta of what the industry is going to do. I think it's more around uh, democratization of, of all things. Um, and then secondly, uh, yeah, wor working with corporations, I, I just wanted to make a comment around that. Specifically, um, you know, being an advocate and an ambassador, particularly for black artists and artists of African descent, last summer because of all of the social unrest that was happening and kind of this uh, wool that was pulled over America's eyes and really the world in many ways, there were so many corporations approaching uh, black artists, you know, artists of African descent, many of ones that I work with or have managed for years, and they were shifting their language around their values in order to uh, be PC, right? To uh, jump on the social justice train and um, I don't know how many conversations I've had with artists within the studio and within their practice around the guilt that comes along with, hey, I've been waiting in my studio for an opportunity for a PR company, for a corporation, for Coca-Cola, whomever, to come and want to collaborate with me. And I remind them about their end game. Is this on your terms or their terms? Because they're coming to you at a particular time. If it's not part of the career roadmap that we've been working on for the last two years, does this serve you? Does this bring you closer to where you want to be and become whole and complete? If it doesn't, I promise you, there will be a thousand other things in America, in society, that will drive, you know, attention one way or the other, but you have to stick to your core values and look at that roadmap and say, all right, you know, are our values representative today or do they have a long history of showing what support looks like? So thank you for that comment. The strategy behind tokenism. 
You guys have made my job so easy. <laughs> the best thing as a moderator is when you don't talk because you want to hear from you guys. I want to thank the three of you so much for being in discussion together and with me today and coming out to New York. Again, I want to thank, we got another one? Oh, we have, we have time, Let's we have time. It. We're here. Well, I want to thank you guys for being here. Uh, um, my name is Caroline. I am now pursuing a career in jewelry uh, after a couple of years of working in finance. And it's kind of scary to hear, you know, maybe established artists are having a hard time making money in this industry. But uh, my question is basically, are you guys supporting established artists or are you guys also working with, you know, new artists or, you know, people who are coming out of school or stuff like that, so. Um, so I'll start off. Uh, we, our business right now is designed around working with artists who already have some market traction, um, already are able to demonstrate a certain regular income within certain, within certain ranges. Um, that category goes from sort of emerging to break out to sort of unrecognized or overlooked, overlooked artists. Um, in the future, I mean, we've got, to, we've got to prove this model successful before I can make any promises, but in the future, I very much look at inversion art as a alternative to a kind of MFA program, right? And our, our business is, is, is modeled after a very well-known tech accelerator called Y Combinator, based in Silicon Valley. And YC basically served as the, the formal education for my co-founder, right? I mean, um, someone for whom YC was, was his kind of college and graduate school and business school all wrapped up into one, and it has given him all these opportunities later on. That's what we want Inversion to be for artists, you know, three, four, five years down the line. Um, we just need to get it up and running first, and in order to get it up and running, we start with artists who've already got some market traction. I think uh, for me, it's, it's a, it's, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for kicking it off. Um, I, it's across the pipeline. I look at, you know, every stage as being completely important and relevant because you want people to move up, right? Like, I want you to be the next David German, you know? If, it's, I shouldn't be dropping brand names on this, <laughs> but you know what I mean. I want you to get to, to where you need to, but what are the resources you need to get to that point? So it's very much an investment into the entire pipeline and identifying the gaps that stop you from getting to that next stage. Um, so I think the emerging artists are just as important as the established artists and all of them should be growing and being more sustainable and increasing their revenues and increasing the number of employees they have and being able to have more creative freedom than what they had five years ago, right? But if you're not... Uh, investing into even the, the, the bottom level, right? Like just the ideation stage of it, then you're not gonna elevate the rest of it. I've worked with a, a few jewelry designers in Memphis and outside of Memphis um, where they came and talked to me and they graduated from MFA programs working within sculpting or whatever category, textiles for some. Um, and they just didn't know how to just sell their things into a jewelry shop. Right, And so it was starting with that business plan and figuring out how do we turn that into this next stage and then saying how do we make sure that you have what you need to, let's move you from thinking only in that artist category to thinking like an entrepreneur that you need to buy more gems and so you're gonna have to qualify for this level of line of credit, right? If you aren't getting your banks to recognize the established groups, you're never gonna get those emerging ones to be able to have that line of credit. So I think it's all really important. Identify the gaps, continue to grow that pipeline. So they're, they're essential. Um, they work hand in hand. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think as um, a supplement to a lot of the establishments and uh, organizations that are out there, um, I love the early, right? Early career, emerging, however you want to call it. I mean, if you just wake up tomorrow and you decide you want to manifest your idea into an object, let's talk. Call Jeremiah. <laughs> right? Um, I, I do cater my services specifically and exclusively to artists of African descent um, from a one-on-one -on -one management and engagement level where I'm walking my community who needs the support. Uh, 
I, I put a majority of my focus and prioritize my community, but that doesn't mean I, does, I, I don't help others. Actually, next week I'll be doing another entrepreneurship boot camp with um, the Center for Cultural Innovation. Um, I've done several in Lagos, Nigeria, and a couple for some art incubator spaces in, um, uh, in London. Um, and it's the same content, it's just a workshop format. Um, but I really enjoy looking at issues, problems, and challenges, building a career roadmap based on your values and your end game, and understanding where you are now, where you want to go, and like my business says, how we can open doors for you. So um, I like the early career, but uh, I've been working with artists for five years, and you know they're no longer the same. And it hurts a little bit, you know. It's like they're grown, <laughs> and uh, you know they're having shows here, and they're you know they're selling art way more than my fees were at the time we started working. So it, it feels different. But I still enjoy it because we talked about what that looked like, right? And their end game um, included being part of the Armory show or having a solo here in Chelsea or wherever, you know, they have benchmarked their success. And um, that is very fulfilling for me because they also introduce other artists to me, other young, uh, uh, early career, not necessarily young in age, but early career individuals who are curious about entering this space of, of, of creative entrepreneurship. So, great question. I don't want to leave anyone out. Okay. Good? Do you have one? Yeah? Alan. <laughs> I'm just going to chill because, you know, I have my brother up there, so I said, you know, and I know I can speak to you because I also am from institutional philanthropy. I'm a former funder from across the water in Newark. Uh, 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 we'll um, share war stories yeah, afterwards. From the uh, yeah, New Jersey Community Foundation. More war stories on that front. Uh, but Alan Kwabba, the friend punk here. I'm co-founder of Zeal. We are a creative studio cooperative based in Brooklyn, New York, and in Englewood, California. So my question actually is for panelists and for anybody else. But I wonder, with institutions such as the Armory, larger institutions intermediaries and funders, uh, what can the role of these larger institutions that have the approximation to access to wealth and capital uh, to be able to invest in local committee control of the local ecosystems that we're talking about in today's conversation? Where can we find those opportunities? So I'm kind of using the space for some dreaming and scheming around like, where are we finding opportunities in our lived experiences and our work to be able to invest in those local ecosystems. So for example, in New York City, even if we took one facet of the arts and cultural ecosystem in a particular neighborhood, I'll pick Bed-Stuy for instance. Yeah. What could the Armory be doing or is already doing that we can point to that says we're going to take whatever revenue that we're taking from here and investing it back in that local ecosystem and where are you seeing that in your work? So that's the, the larger question. Where are we seeing opportunities where we're seeing larger institutions that have the surplus wealth and are reinvesting it back into local communities? That's the question. Can I take that? I might yeah. not be the obvious one to do that. But um, so as you're asking the question, I was thinking to myself, one of the ways that they could do it would be to do a incubator program that takes businesses, members of those communities, partners them with artists or gallerists or other people that the, that these, the institutions kind of have access to, and to ask them to come up with new ventures, right? New opportunities, new projects, new things like that, that then the institutions with their access to these capital networks, wealthy funders, foundations, high net worth individuals, whoever you want to talk about, and then push those people to alongside of their regular funding activities, writing checks for the institution, to then actually get involved in investing in some of those ventures and some of those activities where it's not a charitable contribution, it's something that has the capacity to generate a return for the community and for them. And they get involved at the angel level or the seed level. 
And the fact that we don't do that and the institutions don't do that because they're always basically just asking for money for their own operations, their own programming, is a mistake in my view. Now you have models for this. The new museum did New Inc. and it has its incubator and it's a great you know, curiosity because they match artists with technologists and they come up with all sorts of funky, more art than technology solution type of projects. But just imagine if that was actually given the time and space to say, we don't want you to come up with more of an art-based application that no one's ever going to use for some solution that is actually out there for the local community. We want you actually coming up with something that's going to either serve artists, serve the community, serve the, the vendors, or whoever else is actually there as part of that local environment. And it doesn't do that, but it could do that. So there's an opportunity there for other institutions. The Brooklyn Museum could do that. Uh, Queens Museum could do that. Uh, you know. And I think you'd have funders who'd be like, hey, that sounds actually pretty interesting. So we carve off this little incubator space. We can find some grant funding for it. We can find some individual donors for it you know, to get it up and running. But then really the idea is to launch new projects and new ventures and new businesses out of that yep. that are, you know, have requirements. It's got to be within like a five square mile radius or depending on where it is. It's got to include someone who's been in the community for more than 10 years. I mean, you can put all sorts of requirements that you want on it. But then you've got to, you know, you're, you're, you're creating a funnel for the capital that the institutions have access to, to move out to those, those places. That would be my solution. And the best thing that these institutions can do to guarantee their own existence and their own continued to success is to, is to integrate this model that he just described. Because we know that next generation funders want to fund at the intersection of social impact and the arts if they're going to yep. fund the arts. Yep. Completely distrustful of these large institutions, yep. don't know where the money goes. And so if the institutions can show how they're a conduit to the cause and do that through work in the community and gearing their donors and investors that way, that's what's going to attract young investors young donors who otherwise are never going to write the check to go off in the big black hole. But it, so the sooner they can get that change of values and the change of what who they are and, and think of themselves differently, which doesn't mean they need to stop doing their core mission, but what else can you do to better your community? Because you're just not going to exist unless you do that. It's just bad business not to do that, let alone whether it's the wrong or right thing to do. Yeah, and I want to poke at this a little bit because um, I think it's a great question. Um, my underground background is in public policy, so I'm thinking, and also used to work in banking, so I'm thinking of like Community Reinvestment Act, right? right. Um, that structure where a bank, like I used to work at SunTrust, it's like you open a branch here, you have to put X number of dollars in the community for financial literacy, for mortgages, X, Y, Z, so if- Typically through CDFIs, that's Community correct. Development Financial Institutions, just right. to piggyback off of that, keep going. Right, right, so that's, to use Jonathan's word that I always like to use, street level, right? That's very local, that's accessible. Those are the organizations on Marcus Garvey in Brooklyn, in yeah. Bed-Stuy, that everyone who lives there knows and trusts, but they may have not been to MoMA or the Met or wherever. So I think part of it is, is it a, a, a policy-based solution where we're now somewhat forcing the hand of institutions, uh, corporations that you know, are lured because like the Armory Show, like large museums and um, well-funded organizations, they were lured by someone. They're building permits, there are all of these bureaucratic kind of red tape things that they had to go through, but what are the other uh, things that haven't been asked in that conversation before this building permit has been signed off on, right? It's like, all right, well, we understand XYZ organizations also need some additional support next year when you do <laughs> Armory Show Live. <laughs> you know, here are some options for you to expand what that programming looks like, right? And, you know, already kind of teeing that up before, you know, uh, a large event like this brings international visitors and an audience that's a you know global, et cetera. So, what what does that look like? Is it a policy solution, or are you looking to like uh, task the executives and the leaders and the founders of these organizations, whether they be commercial or you know from the um, you know uh, the nonprofit sector or otherwise? Who are we looking at? 
Yeah, I just, uh, so in, in Memphis, we have an organization called Arts Memphis. I'm now the committee chair for our, um, our, our grant making committee, right? And one of the things I've been really hard on has been for these institutions, any of them, you know, what has been the investment back into the community with those dollars that they are awarded, right? So if we give $100,000 to you, are you sending that all out outside of the city or are you keeping some of it here? And then also if I'm funding you for what you say is an enhancement, right? So I, I, I have tired of these transactional relationships and I'm tired, I, I'm tired of those, right? If we do another like just, oh, we're just gonna do Black History Month and that's it. But when I come the other 11 months of the year, I ain't seen a black person in there, that you're not doing the work, right? That money is not actually being allocated. How much of that money that you're awarded in grants? So the tone at the top, right? So the tone of who's the funders, what are the foundations asking for when I look at this grant application has to be more thorough. Right? I think we've just said we're going to give you the money, you did the thing, you did the transaction, and then we just stop. But we go into so many museums and you'll say, okay, we have, we're serving this population in this one event a year, right? And then you have, your stuff not even in multiple languages. Like I can't find a brochure that's in Spanish, but you do Spanish Heritage Month every year. You've been, I've been funding you for the last 20 years on Spanish Heritage Month and you ain't got nothing in Spanish in here. You're not really doing the work. And so I think it's the tone at the top that has to be a little bit stricter and you gotta be okay with pissing some people off, right? Like in order to see that change to happen. So I think much to what you said, in order to see that happen, we have to also talk to these funders and say, you gotta get the guidelines a little bit. We gotta hold people accountable. Right, there's gotta be more we've gotta do and we can't just keep doing the same thing. So thanks, Jeremiah, that was a really good point. Same thing, Jonathan. Thank you. I think we're good. Any more? We'll be mingling down here if you wanna talk with any of these great folks one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, Such everyone. a pleasure. We Thank you all for being you. here. Thank you, Eliza. Thank you, team.